I seriously cannot get over how good this new microphone sounds. I mean, compared to the Snowball mic that I had before that would just pick up like every single little sound, absolutely everything. This one, it's it just sounds so... Like before I felt like I sounded so far away, but now I feel like really close. At like, I don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, it's crazy because this is even like the cheapest of these upper class microphones, these podcast mics. It's so cheap. In fact, think about this. The, <laughs> the, the stand that it came with, because it came with a mic stand, like a little, it's probably about a foot tall mic stand is 100% plastic. So... <laughs> So, I mean, this is so cheap. And yet, I can't imagine how my natural voice can sound any better than it does right now. I think if I were to one day buy a more expensive microphone, I think what they do is it would just automatically convert my voice to sound like Morgan Freeman or that guy from the the uh, Planet Earth documentaries because... How can it sound any better? This is, this is awesome, and yeah, I don't. I, let's just let's get. I mean, I I know we heard this on the last interview that I did with Rob and Catherine, which was amazing. If you haven't listened to it, but it it uh, not having like just doing like a bio. I'm so excited to do this bio with this microphone, and so I'm not. I'm going to stop rambling about it because I could just keep going on and on about it because I'm so excited. I still have to kind of get used to it too because I'm I've got these monitoring headphones on, which I'm not used to at all. And so it kind of is kind of this weird feeling, but we're going to go for it and it's going to be awesome. So uh, just a couple of announcements. It, we, oh, oh, uh, yes. So with these announcements, one thing is we actually have shirts and the we only made, these are limited edition shirts because we wanted to just kind of, I just I just wanted to thank basically the people who have stood with us, you listeners who've been with us, we're, we're celebrating this is episode five. No, this is episode six. So we're actually celebrating six weeks of actually doing this show, which honestly is just like really cool for me because uh, the fact that you guys have stood with me in this and listened to these episodes. And I honestly, whenever I started, I was like, nobody's, nobody's actually going to listen to this. This is uh, talking about church history and church revival. There aren't a lot of people who are super interested in that nowadays. And so I didn't think we'd have any listeners and we've got a handful of you. And so we are making only 20 of these limited edition shirts. And the thing about them is they're going to be, I don't even know if anybody's really going to understand them <laughs> based on our listener base, but some of you might, uh, it, but it's going to say OG or the shirts say OG revival carrier, which if you don't know what OG means, it means like old gangster, which nowadays basically means like the original, one of the originals. So there's only going to be 20 of them and they're specifically for people who have been with us. And I mean, if you're just listening and if you want, and you want one of the shirts, if there are any left, then go for it. I don't know how many we're going to sell in this first round, but we're going to be selling these shirts just you know, as a way for you to be like, I'm, I was part of the originals, one of the original listeners of the Revival Carriers podcast. And uh, just, just to kind of stand with us, right? Because you guys have been a blessing and you've been supporting us. And that's why I'm still doing this. That's why I'm still doing the, all of the research and setting up these, these, uh, I'm basically having to learn so much because I'm setting up these interviews with people like with Rob and Catherine doing it over Zoom. I'd never done anything like that before. I had to learn figure out how to do an interview like that on on zoom and so just learning all of these new things has been a wild ride and you guys are the ones who are inspiring me to continue doing this keep going on keep doing all this research keep doing everything required for this so i just want to thank you so we made these shirts and just so you know these are not like generic shirts that we just got off of some website my wife and i made these shirts by hand we actually have t-shirt making equipment for the ministry that we direct found ministries and we bought this equipment to make shirts for that ministry and so we hand made these 20 shirts I designed them myself and they're they're simple shirts they aren't super fancy but it just says OG revival carrier on the front and on the back it just says revival carriers podcast and it's just a way for you guys to continue showing your support for us showing your love for us and our way of just lovingly hand making these shirts for you here in the very same we call it the sweatshop the same sweatshop that uh, <laughs> that I do these podcasts in 
And it's just, it's growing and we're excited. So today we're going to be looking at a woman that I'm telling you what, this woman is a hero of the faith. And it's really sad because she's, she should be far more known than she is. But unfortunately she was overshadowed by the time that she lived in. And we're, we are going to be talking about Lucy Farrow. Lucy Farrow is known as the mother of Pentecost. And you will see why as we go throughout this bio with her, because she truly was that. She truly, uh, with the Holy Spirit, she birthed what is now known as the Pentecost. Well, I would say the Azusa Street movement that really caused the uh, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement to happen. Lucy was an incredible woman of God. And so, uh, yeah. Where let's just get into it. I'm just going to pull my notes up here real quick. I started talking about the microphone. I forgot to pull my notes up. So Lucy Fair. Oh, just very, very quickly. Sorry to backtrack a little bit. I wasn't even looking at my notes, so I, I missed this stuff. But yeah, if you want to, we, we want to start doing questions. So like if you had a question for Rob and Catherine, if you listen to that interview and you're like, oh, I'd love to ask them something, you can either go onto our Facebook page, Revival Carriers Podcast, and write your question in there. Like the page, we've already got over a hundred likes, which is really exciting, and we've got more people who are following. So, if you have questions for the missionaries or questions for myself, or you can email if you don't like doing Facebook, you can email at revivalcarrierspodcast at gmail.com. And also, as always, if you want to support the podcast, then financially, then you can just do it through PayPal at www.paypal dot m e slash alan crookham or just check out the show notes the description of this podcast and there will be other options as well so now the last couple of bios that we did they were during the reformation and i was i was tempted to stay in that block of time because there's so many amazing and wild people there but honestly i mean we could we could spend months maybe even the rest of this year just on the reformation if we wanted but i decided this this isn't a podcast about the Reformation. This is it's about individuals who stand out in history or are currently making history. That's why we do these interviews as well, because it isn't just about historical figures, but there are people right now who are impacting and transforming nations. And those people we want to get as close to as possible. We want to learn from them, learn what they pray about, learn, learn how they think, learn their stories, because it is through those stories that we can learn uh, quite a bit and we can grow in our faith with the Lord. I know, for, I know for myself, a lot of these things that I'm studying on this podcast, the questions that I ask the people I interview, most of them, I, I, they are for you. But they're also kind of selfishly for me as well, because I have a lot that I want to learn. And these people, they have such a depth of experience and understanding and the wealth of knowledge that we can get from people who are bringing revival now, as well as the people who are, uh, who are, who are historic, like Lucy Farrow, like John Welch, like John Knox, these people we've already studied And I know for me, I learned a ton, especially from Lucy. She is, man, she was a blessing. And so I I just decided, I resisted the temptation. I decided to move away from the Reformation. I'm sure we're going to eventually go back there. So if you have been loving these these studies on the Reformation, don't worry. It isn't over. We're just going to, I don't want to get trapped in there in just the vortex of of the Reformation. And so since we did our first bio on St. Patrick, which was way back in the 400s AD, I decided to go the opposite direction and look at someone who is closer to modern times, but is almost completely unknown by the church. And she is a revival carrier if there ever was one. And if those of you who have been listening to the podcast and those of you who know me personally, you know, if there's one thing I love, it's people who are, who were in obscurity, but did amazing things. People like John Welch, who wasn't famous, people like Lucy Farrow, people who there aren't books, there aren't a lot of books about them, there isn't a lot of information about them, but they were incredibly powerful people. And so Lucy Farrow, she was one of those people. And uh, she was involved in the, the Azusa Street Revival. Most Christians who believe in the whole power of the Holy Spirit, whether you're Pentecostal, charismatic, or some other variation of that, chances are you have heard of the Azusa Street Revival. And now, just just in case 
you may have heard of it, but you don't know all the details. I know for myself, I've been studying the Azusa Street Revival like many many believers have to, to learn from it. But there's when I started, just like anybody, I didn't know anything about it. So just to give you kind of a little bit of a background, the Azusa Street Revival, it started on April 9th, 1906 on a street called Bonnie Bray. And it was in Los Angeles, California. And the revival is credited to have been led by a man named William Seymour, who was an African-American man who was the son of a freed slave and blind in one eye. He had studied these newly founded Pentecostal doctrines by a man named Charles Parham in a time when segregation was still in place, racism was still rampant. It was a really, really, there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of crazy things that were happening in the United States at that time. And we are certainly going to talk, we're going to go into those things and talk just about what the context was in which the Azusa Street Revival really took place because as you guys have heard me, I guess the word would be complain about because I really disapprove of this, uh, and which is some one of the main reasons I started this podcast was to kind of shine a light on things, is the fact that so often when you read stories of revivals, whenever you read missionary tales and biographies and all these, these things, so often all of the ugly stuff, all of the the hard stuff is just sort of brushed over, unless it's something heroic, unless it's something heroic like the missionaries were stuck in a house, and this is a true story, the missionaries were stuck in a house and they were surrounded by a tribe of people wanting to kill them. They're throwing spears and arrows at the door and the missionaries prayed and prayed and prayed and eventually a bunch of angels show up around the house physically manifesting and scare off all the tribesmen and they all run away and then a big revival breaks out. Unless it's a story like that, things get left out of the history books and Christian history, unfortunately. And they don't talk about how missionaries or ministers or just men and women who had an effect, had the, the struggles that they went through, the personal struggles, the, the, the things that aren't highlights, They're the things that aren't the years that they spent just fighting. No, I'm not talking physical fighting, but just fighting and pushing for revival, pushing for the move of God, pushing for things to happen. We only ever read about when it when the when the answer came. It's like in the book of Daniel. You know, Daniel he fasted 21 days and then he gets the answer and everyone always jumps ahead to the 21 days and they don't think about the fact that there were 21 days. That's a long time. 21 days of not eating, of feeling hungry, of feeling weak, of maybe feeling dizzy, maybe feeling, probably feeling tired, probably feeling physical exhaustion, and yet continuing to go on about his daily life for 21 days, not knowing if the answer was going to come, not knowing how it was going to come. And most of us give up immediately after a day, if in, if, if we've even fasted. And so I really like to talk... Uh, so much. I love talking about the context of what was happening in the world, or at least in the region where these things happened, because it was not easy. It was not as simple as they just decided to pray and God started moving. There were always all kinds of barriers, all kinds of things that came against them. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about exactly what it was like for people like Lucy Farrow and William Seymour, who were both African-American, to be alive and moving in revival in this time. And so as for William Seymour, and I will probably repeat this a couple of times throughout this podcast, but I don't want to go too far into his story because I want to do a separate bio on Seymour. I, I actually think that maybe maybe the next podcast that I do will be on William Seymour because I mean, it just fits, you know, it's like John Welch and John Knox. They went hand in hand. They, they were both influential in the same area, roughly the same time period. And so Seymour and Lucy, they were the same. They were very, very, very much entwined. And you're going to hear about him throughout this podcast as well, even though the podcast is about Lucy. So I'm thinking possibly next time I have to think, I have to, I really want to think about it a little bit more. But um, yeah, the, the William Seymour might be our next bio podcast that we do. And so I just want to, what I do want to point out about Seymour is just how the church 
has often been guilty of racism on so many levels. William Seymour is a prime example of this because when he was studying under Charles Parham, who was a white man, he was not allowed to even sit in the class with the other white people. He actually had to go outside the door and listen from outside the door on on those classes. And so whenever the Azusa Street Revival started gaining traction, and he and the, the people in his church in the Azusa Street Mission actually faced a lot of persecution, even though the Azusa Street Mission had a lot of integration. There were whites, there were Latinos, there were African Americans, even though there was that diversity within that church, which was very unique in that time, a lot of jealous white Pentecostal leaders and other white ministers, they basically sabotaged the Azusa Street revival largely because of the fact that it was African Americans who were leading it, which was I mean, utter, utter foolishness, unscriptural on so many levels. But if we learned anything from our podcast on John Knox, it is that God uses broken vessels who are willing to be available in order to push the kingdom forward, and then God slowly breaks down those doctrines and those wrong doctrines in human thinking. Like uh, many people don't realize how far for this is just an example of this. Many people don't realize how far we've come in our understanding of God and how how God has to be patient with us through generations of mistakes. So often we want the mistakes the wrong doctrines, the false things to just be fixed immediately. We put out one sermon, put out one podcast, or write one book and think that all of these wrong doctrines are going to be fixed. But that's just not how it works. God's perspective is outside of time. And so His ways are not our ways. We know know these verses. So we have to learn to be patient because God is extremely patient, not with just one individual, but he's patient with generations of Christians because he he sees the individual, but he also sees the whole generation as a whole. And that's super clear in the Old Testament. And so one example of God being patient and correcting doctrine comes from the Pentecostal movement itself. So this, this may be hard to believe in a world where right now speaking in tongues is not only commonplace in in any really Pentecostal charismatic church, but it's actually expected in spirit-filled churches. But believe this or not, speaking in tongues was actually not common at all for probably 1,500 years in the church. From the time the early church doctrines started to be corrupted, which is roughly like 400, 500 AD, speaking in tongues largely faded uh, aside from like a, ha- a handful of believers who drew particularly close to the Holy Spirit during the Reformation, which we just spent those two bio podcasts on, there were a lot of miracles like we heard of with John Welch and other people around him. But there isn't really much record of anybody speaking in tongues, again, uh, other than maybe a couple uh, a couple of uh, what would be called Catholic saints. Because, because of the religiosity of the Catholic Church and the Reformation, a lot of the focus was on having right doctrine and holiness, which is why we had movements like the Puritans and the Quakers and people like that who focused more on calls to purity and repentance. And so without going into too much detail, what happened was that in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the church was an absolute mess. In the United States, after 200 years of rules and regulation, from the the Reformation with very little Holy Spirit relationship and power, people were literally starved for the supernatural. So because there was no teaching on the power of God, because remember what everyone, the, the Catholic Church focused so much on mystical experiences and the supernatural and angels and all of these things that it had become idolatry. And so whenever the Protestants, when the Reformation took place and the Protestants rose into prominence in the church, they almost entirely rejected supernatural experiences because they became associated with the Catholic, or they were associated with the Catholic movement. So the, and, and the Protestants saw this as, oh, well, this is unscriptural. We don't see these things happening in scripture from there, the way that they looked and studied. So they went away from the supernatural, and every human being has an inner hunger for the supernatural. Everybody does. It doesn't matter whether they believe in 
what they believe in. It doesn't matter if they believe in God or don't believe in God. Everybody has a desire for the supernatural. And so there was this vacuum that took place in the United States after the, the founding fathers came, the pilgrims, the, which were Puritans, and then you have the Quakers. These people, they came from the Reformation with the teachings of the Reformation, and so they were starved. They were starved for encounters with God. They were starved for the kingdom of heaven. They were starved for something other than just doctrinal teachings. And back in those days, what was common, the common way of preaching, and whenever we talk about George Whitfield one day, we'll talk about how he changed this, but uh, because the, the, the Protestants were so against emotion, they were so against uh, manipulation, which is, of course, right, you shouldn't manipulate but they were so against it that they went completely the opposite direction. And instead of preaching with any kind of emotion, any tears, any anything that they would consider to be manipulating people, they would actually write down their sermons word for word and then just stand there and just read them purposefully monotone, purposefully not showing any emotion so that they couldn't be accused of manipulation. And so people were just starved. They were starved for encounters. They were, in star- they, were, they were starved for those things. So because there was no teaching on the power of God, no teaching on the Holy Spirit like we have today, people did what they usually do, and they turned to the world for answers instead of God, which it's hard to blame people when they sit under a pastor or under a minister who doesn't teach any of those things and maybe even teaches that it's wrong, but they inwardly have a starvation and a hunger for those things. They can't turn to their pastor. They Most people will generally think that that's just how the church is. Most people have an encounter with one church, and they associate all churches with that one thing, especially if they were hurt by it. They believe the whole church is that way. And so for, for the people in the United States, they, what are they going to do? Who are they going to turn to? All of the preachers teach that those things are are not tr- are not good. They're not from God. That supernatural experiences and the power of God it can only be the devil. Of course, that's what people always say. It's the devil if it's something supernatural and they don't believe in it. And so people did what they usually do. They turned to the world for answers. And as a result, witchcraft was very very prominent in the United States in those days, in the early 1700s, 1800s. There were open displays of demonic power, so a lot of people in the church either practiced witchcraft or they would consult mediums or witch doctors rather than the Holy Spirit, which I know sounds crazy. It sounds crazy that Christians would go to witches and mediums in order to uh, get some kind of uh, direction from the Holy Spirit, but honestly, well, I guess I wouldn't say from the Holy Spirit, from the spirits, but honestly, even if you look at most of the church today, there are so many churches. There are so many Christians even today who go to fortune tellers, or they they uh, even even I don't want to get super super what's the word over religious about it. But even people who take like fortune cookies seriously, and there there are plenty of Christians that I have met that I know who they still pay attention to zodiac signs and those things instead of going to the Holy Spirit, instead of going to the Lord, they go to these things that are witchcraft. They are they are not good things. They open doors and we should not participate in them. And so I wouldn't judge so harshly the Christians of those days because they probably didn't think of it as any big deal to go to a fortune teller. And so uh, it was one of the, well, during that time, it was one of the biggest movements of witchcraft in the history of the United States. And uh, that's actually during that time, during the 1800s, is whenever the some of the biggest errors and cults in U.S. history were started. For example, in the early 1800s, Joseph Smith founded Mormonism right around this time. And he was a full-on fortune teller. He practiced witchcraft, and that's how he made his living do it. He was, uh, he was what they called a glass looker, which was whenever people would come to him, and in his particular business, he would tell people where to find buried treasure. And they would come to him, and they would pay him money, and then he would throw stones into a rock, uh, sorry, a hat, like a top hat, and then he would put his face over it and look at the stones, and depending on the way the light reflected off the stones, he would tell people where to find buried treasure. And he was not good at this job, which is why he was arrested and fined multiple times as a fraud, but we we won't go into his whole story. But he was so good at manipulating and lying 
and he faked and pretended to have all kinds of supernatural experiences. And because he was so open about it in a time where supernatural experiences were frowned upon by the church, he amassed a huge following and it was all people who were starved to starving for the supernatural. And so they believed him. They believed that he was a prophet, even though he was a complete con man proven to be over and over and over again. You also have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were started in the 1870s by Charles Taze Russell, whose entire ministry was popularized and based on false end times prophecies and wild predictions. You have Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists in the 1860s. She supposedly had somewhere between 100 and 200 visions and is considered not only a prophetess by her followers, but her writings are considered to be holy and almost on the same level as the Bible. They don't say they're scripture, but they certainly follow them more than they do scripture. Uh, Otherwise, they wouldn't be falling back into the old law like she led them to in error. All of these happened, all of these cults and these wrong doctrines happened during these 1800s, well, throughout the century of the 1800s. And there were and always were and always will be a remnant of believers who didn't follow all the witchcraft, didn't follow all the lies. However, they did start to question where all of these supernatural things that were happening around them came from because the supernatural was happening. People were having these uh, demonic spiritual experiences and the church, finally the ministers, they started to ask what, what is happening? Why the, where they were losing people by the dozens, losing, losing churches, losing because people were going to witchcraft rather than to the Holy spirit, rather than to Jesus And so people started asking, what's as the church should do? If the church is not being effective, it's time to reevaluate what we're doing. And that's that's a a call out to to our church today as well, because we're in the same situation where over the past 20 years, the church in the United States has declined. Church attendance has declined 1% a year. So we are down 20% and only dropping. And we should ask ourselves why that is, just like the Christians back then did, And so these ministers started to question and they weren't seeing anything from God. They they didn't know how to seek God. So what did they do? They did what we should all be doing. They started to study their Bible and they eventually settled on Pentecost in Acts chapter two. And they decided together that the church should have the kind of power that they saw there. And that the answer was to come together and wait and pray like the apostles did until the Holy Spirit came on them in power. So they're seeking God in the late 1800s, like the final decade of the of the 1800s. They're seeking God, seeking the Holy Spirit. They want to experience Pentecost. They want to experience uh, that old school religion. And in 1901, they were having one of their meetings where they were waiting on God. They, they would wait for hours and hours because... They followed the scriptural Old Testament model of uh, just waiting because they didn't know what else to do. And so they would sing hymns, they would teach, they would do exactly what they saw the apostles doing in the book of Acts. And about 11 p.m., they were at this meeting in 1901, and a 30 year old Bible student of Charles Parham, her name was Agnes Osman, she felt compelled to ask for prayer to speak in tongues because that was. What they saw in Pentecost was the power of God would come, and they all spoke in tongues. So speaking in tongues was, for them, that was the sign they saw. Now remember, people had not been speaking in tongues for like 1,500 years. They didn't know what that was like. All Pretty much all knowledge of what that looked like or meant was gone. And so they, they were praying for God to do something that they didn't even know, they didn't even understand. So Agnes, she felt compelled to ask for prayer to speak in tongues, And so she asked, and uh, the other students came and prayed for her along with Charles. And according to them, they felt like a bolt of lightning came out of heaven and hit them. And then a halo of light surrounded Agnes's face and her head, and she started speaking in tongues. And this is really the spark that got the initial revival movements happening. It was her speaking in tongues, but there were lots of mistakes made. 
because they didn't have an understanding of what speaking in tongues was. They didn't know what it was. And so whenever she spoke in tongues for that first time, she spoke in a language that they believed was Chinese. And so they did what we humans often do when the Holy Spirit starts to move and they started making assumptions. They presumed or assumed that they knew what was happening because God was moving. And I will tell you right now, if the Holy Spirit starts to move and you don't understand it, you don't understand what you're seeing, the worst thing that you can do is make assumptions about what's happening. That's what so many people do is they, they completely will go one ex- to one extreme or the other, one extreme where they believe absolutely everything they see to be the Holy Spirit moving, and even if it's some degrading, wacko kind of thing that the Holy Spirit wouldn't do, they just believe that it's the Holy Spirit, or they believe that just everything is the devil because they don't understand it. So it's it's important to, to seek the Holy Spirit on things. Whenever you start seeing some kind of movement of the Holy Spirit or some manifestation you don't understand, don't just throw it out. Ask him, spend time. Don't just immediately make a judgment. And that's what that's what these people did. These original Pentecostals, they hear Agnes Olsman speak in tongues, and they're like, "Oh, well, we know what that is because they because she spoke in Chinese. At least they believe she spoke in Chinese." They decided that uh, because Agnes spoke in Chinese, and because other people, when they started speaking in tongues, it sounded like earthly languages to them. And so, what they took that to mean was whatever language you were speaking whenever you spoke in tongues, that was the nation that you were called to go to as a missionary. And so they ended up sending all kinds of people onto the mission field. Now, remember that this is a time when they don't have planes. It was just like long boat rides to go overseas and it was risky and dangerous. And they would send all these people overseas who were convinced they could speak this foreign language because they spoke in tongues And it wasn't the international climate that we have today where if someone felt like, like in Agnes's case, let's say she felt like she she thought that she spoke in Chinese, she couldn't like go to Chinatown in New York and try to speak with Chinese people and then she would get the language and then realize whether or not she knew it. They had to literally go overseas, pay all of this money, buy a boat ticket, risk everything and go And in their cases, most of them would arrive to their mission field and then realize to their horror that they couldn't understand or speak the language and that they had just wasted this big trip, a lot of money, put everybody at risk. So through all of those errors, and not just small errors, these, these are big errors, they had to learn the purpose of speaking in tongues and what they were actually for. And again, I don't wanna I don't wanna keep preaching because I wanna move on with this this podcast and this bio, but I just, I can't make it clear enough that you, that you should not just assume things when the Holy Spirit is moving. Take the time to study it out. Take the time to seek the Holy Spirit on what to do with what you're given. It's so important. It will save you so many issues in your life, so many big mistakes in your life. I want to clarify one thing though. They were not totally wrong in their belief on speaking in tongues being another human language. I and that sometimes people have the gift of another language downloaded to them because this does in fact happen and it has happened countless times, probably thousands and thousands of times over the course of history. And I've personally I've met many people who have had that miracle happen to them. Even John Welch, if you listen to episode two, you'll know that that happened with him in a way. So don't take it to mean that I'm saying that that can't happen because it does. And it just, it just isn't the primary reason for tongues. They're like, like they believed back then. I, I, speaking in tongues is important, but I think that's actually a separate miracle. Learning, supernaturally having a earthly language that you understand that you can speak and that sticks with you, that is a different miracle than speaking in tongues. Because when you speak in tongues, yes, sometimes it is an earthly language. But if you don't automatically, if you can't understand it like you understand English or your native tongue, then it's not the same miracle. And that's just, it's just an important little tip on speaking in tongues. So, okay. So now that we've established that the early Pentecostal church, they had all kinds of flaws, all kinds of wrong doctrines. Let's move forward with Lucy Farrow, because that's who we're here to talk about today. And uh, 
So uh, I'm going to switch right to William Seymour, but I promise you <laughs> this has to do with Lucifer. They were, they were just so entwined together. And so William Seymour is credited with having led the Azusa Street Revival, like I said. But if you read some of the bio- biographies and eyewitness testimonies about the revival, they actually really paint a different picture. There are some books out there like uh, They Told Us Our Stories uh, or They Told Me Their Stories, the, the Azusa Street book, Frank Bartleman's book on Azusa Street. There are multiple books on the Azusa Street Revival that are so key, that are that are written by eyewitnesses who were actually there. And they really do paint a different picture than what most people think about the Azusa Street Revival. Because William Seymour, he was more the face of the revival. And yes, technically he was the leader because he was the pastor of the Azusa Street Mission. But the truth is, uh, William Seymour actually spent the majority of his time in his prayer room. I mean, hours and hours a day. And he would only come out once or twice a day just to sort of tell people what he felt the Lord was speaking or he would preach. And there were uh, incredible, mind-blowing miracles that would happen. But he actually had a whole group of really powerful people that did the majority of the ministry and the day-to-day aspects of hosting the revival. And people who really took care of things because, well, I don't, I don't want to ramble, but basically in churches, there are so many behind the scenes people who are really the ones that keep everything running. And even though the pastor, even though the pastor is the face of the church and the leader of the church, often it is forgotten that there is usually a whole army of people behind him who are doing so much or her who are doing so much of the work. And so Lucy Farrow was just one of those people. William Seymour, I'm, what I'm saying is not to put him down. He was an incredible man. And like I said, we'll do, we'll do a bio on him. But it's just I just want to point out that he wasn't the only one who was doing things. He, the, there were other people who were really, really important. And Lucy Farrow was one of them. And just to set the background for Lucy, for her, her life, because again, I want you to understand the context of what was happening. Lucy Farrow, she was born in 1851 in Norfolk, Virginia, which was only, I mean, that was only 10 years before the Civil War started. So think about like all of this stuff is happening. The Civil War is only 10 years away. It was right smack when all the crazy witchcraft and cults that I was talking about earlier were being formed. She was born into slavery she was the niece of the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and her entire childhood must have been extremely difficult, extremely stressful. From the time she was born until she turned 10 would have been that period of just total civil unrest and turmoil that led up to the Civil War. And then when she turns 10 years old in March 1861, Abraham Lincoln gets voted into office. And then on April 12th, 1861, that same year, just a month later, Confederate forces fired on Union troops at Fort Sumter just over a simple request for provisions from a man named Major Robert Anderson to President Lincoln. That's what started the Civil War. It was it was it got to this boiling point and just the the major at Fort Sumter requests provisions, which Abraham Lincoln sends. And so the Confederate forces start firing on the fort and attacking. So Lucy is alive during all this and not only alive, but in Virginia. And so uh, there's all this war that takes place. The civil war happens. It goes on from 1861 until 1865. The civil war finally ends. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated and then begins the construct, the re what they call the reconstruction era which is after the the slaves were freed, which Lucy was one of those slaves, whenever her family was freed, they went through the Reconstruction area, which the Reconstruction area, that took place between the years of 1865 and 1877. And this was even just even more turmoil and persecution for a teenage African-American girl like Lucy Farrow. Through all of this, Think about this. They're, they're, the Civil War happens. African Americans are free. And so the African American people, they of course hope, and you can only imagine what Lucy, who was a teenager, how she must have felt through all of this when she saw all of this. She must have thought that life was going to get better for African Americans, that things would just clear up. They were free. There must have been a lot of hope. 
but there were just still so many racists, so many outright evil people out there, including a man named Thomas Dartmouth Rice. And Thomas Rice, if you've never heard of him, he was a stage actor that created a character named Jim Crow. Now remember, Lucy Farrow is alive. We're not talking about just specifically about racism. I'm trying to paint a picture for you so that you understand how Lucy must have felt living in this world. So Thomas writes, he creates this character named Jim Crow, and essentially he traveled around the United States in blackface, humiliating African Americans and their culture, and was an extremely popular act. He was he was a, 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 tra- a traveling theater minstrel. They called him a minstrel. He was a traveling theater guy, and his whole career was based on humiliating African Americans. And it was so popular, in fact, that in 1877, whenever the southern states enacted the laws enforcing segregation, they called those laws the Jim Crow laws, basically honoring this disgusting man. And if you aren't familiar with Jim Crow laws, I really suggest you read more about them on your own. But basically, if you've ever seen those photos or period movies that show like a drinking fountain that says whites only, and then there would be another fountain that has a sign over that says like colored people only or bathrooms that say colored people here and, or whites in this bathroom, it's, uh, that was the world that Lucy grew up in. I mean, these were downright evil, unscriptural laws, and the truth is the church was just as guilty of perpetuating this. And I know that this is going to be a controversial thing to say, especially right now when people are, there's a lot of flare-ups about this, but it is the truth. The church was definitely my personal opinion, and I wish I had the, the people and the resources to do something like this, but I think that there should be events that are uh, in stadiums and churches where the church ask for forgiveness from the African-American community for generations of racism. And one of the ways that the church perpetuated this, now not everybody in the church, we know, of course, I'm not generalizing everybody, but there were, there were some wonderful men and women of God who were part of the church in those days who were not racist. But if you don't understand, if you don't know about the church's past in racism, then I just want to let you know that, first of all, the church was part of racism. They, they have been. But the church actually used to teach, and actually in some, some places they still do teach, that whenever Cain killed his brother Abel and God placed a mark on Cain that, that uh, would separate him from other people, the church preached in those days, and as I said, some places still preach this, that the mark that God placed on Cain, the curse that God put on him was making his skin dark, was was making him a black man or an African. Well, he would just be an African back then, was, was making him a black man. And then that was continued to be taught because the question, of course, Cain and Cain lived and all these people lived. And then you have Noah and Noah cursed one of his sons if you know that whole story of whenever one of his sons is making fun of him because he had fallen asleep drunk and he was naked and God cursed that son, uh, I believe it was Ham. He is Ham, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I'm pretty sure it was Ham. Uh, but when, but God, cur- uh, sorry, Noah cursed his son. And once again, the church taught that that was making his skin turn black. And so during these days, the church would have approved, they did approve of segregation because they believed that people who were darker skinned, that those people had been cursed. They were, they were uh, descendants of Cain. They were descendants of the curse, which is why the, which is how the church justified slavery and the many, many church people who fought for slavery, particularly in the South. And so there, the church does have a responsibility to ask for forgiveness. The church does have that responsibility. They, I, I hear people who have said, oh, well, why should I ask for forgiveness for something that I didn't do? And um, honestly, I think that that comes from a place of ignorance for the most part. 
and people don't understand. But I hope that for those of you who are listening, you understand that the church, even if it, you personally didn't do anything or your parents or your grandparents or anyone in your generation, even if they didn't do anything personally, you as part of the church, we it is scriptural. The prophets and the men and women of God, if you read the Bible, they would stay. They would stand up and repent for the sins of their people. They would re- repent for the sins of the church, and we should be doing that as a church. Instead of getting proud and arrogant about it, and and the, the way that I have seen people puff themselves up, understand that the church has a huge responsibility and a huge part in what has happened today. And it is the church's responsibility, regardless of what governments do, regardless of what non-Christians do, the church has a responsibility to ask for forgiveness for our mistakes because we hurt a lot of people, a lot of people that Jesus loved. And it is our responsibility to ask for forgiveness. So I personally, I, I think that we should be having events. I remember years whenever I was a teenager, Lou Engel and the call, I remember going to some of his his call uh, events. And back then they would bring up, I don't know how if they did it every time, just the I, I went to one, I think I went I went to two. I went to one in Kansas and one in Texas. And they would bring Native Americans and they would wash their feet and they would ask for forgiveness for what the uh, what the the pilgrims and and um, settlers and those people had done the the horrible things that they had done coming in they asked for forgiveness and I think that there should be events like that again now and uh, to, for the African American community where we should ask for forgiveness for what has been done so a lot of people they believed in that Lucy being a Christian she was she was alive in this world okay so. I explain all of these things just to just to keep that in mind. She Lucy wasn't just a person in history that we learn about. She was a real human being, a real teenage girl, and throughout every stage of her life, she faced persecution on every single level, not only from uh, non-believers, not only from just white racist people, but also from the church itself. And so many people, this is this is what fascinates me, which gives me, the, I have the utmost respect for people like Lucy Farrow, because so many Christians, they abandon their belief in God when just the most minor thing happens in their lives, like they lost their job, which I know doesn't sound minor, but compared to what these people lived to, for, through, the uh, so so many people have lived through. I think about the missionaries in in China, the and the other underground church, and what what so many people have lived through. People like Lucy, they uh, they stayed loyal to the King of Kings. They stayed loyal to Jesus, and we should all learn from her. So somewhere somewhere throughout all of these things that were happening, most likely about the year 1900, Lucy moved from Virginia to Houston. We don't know all of the details behind this, but she came, became a pastor of a small holiness church there. And as a missionary myself, while we don't have a record of her reason for moving there, I would bet money she moved down to Texas seeing it as a missionary position in the equivalent of a persecuted nation because the Jim Crow laws were still largely in effect and being an African-American woman in the South would have been like moving into a hornet's nest. And because we like little details like the, we like little details on this podcast, I would just like to say that Lucy most likely would have traveled by train to Texas. There were automobiles in those days. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Revival Carriers podcast Facebook page, I posted a video from 1905 that I found just on YouTube of the historic Market Street in San Francisco. It's got sound and everything, guys. It's it's not about a train. It's, it shows cars, but it's it's pretty cool. Now, if you remember the story of Agnes Olsman and how she spoke in tongues in 1901, the year after Lucy began pastoring, the news of this 
outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it spread nationwide. I mean, it was like a wildfire over the course of the following four years. And Charles Parham, who was the leader of the Pentecostal movement at that time, he became a famous preacher and he traveled throughout the States teaching on modern Pentecost and the move of the Holy Spirit. So in the summer of 1905, he came to Houston to do some speaking engagement and a crusade. And during that crusade, he hired Lucy, or I should say Lucy volunteered to be his cook. I don't know what kind of pay she received. She may have received a pay. I don't know. We don't have those details. But whatever happened, Lucy ended up being his cook. Now, if you haven't been involved in outreaches like this, I just want to clarify the picture a little bit and explain how Lucy, who was a pastor, ended up being a cook for Charles Parham during these events. I have organized personally, well over a hundred outreaches overseas. That's one of the main things I did for a good 15 years in ministry, 10, 15 years, was I led international outreaches for local churches. I lived in Panama and Costa Rica, and people would come from the States down there, and I was oftentimes the guy who organized that outreach. And so I will tell you that whenever you organize something like that, Charles Parham would have been the equivalent of like his team coming uh, from Kansas would have been like the equivalent of a mission trip, right? And so when Charles came, I can tell you that what you do is the, the first thing is make contact to local churches and ask if they will partner with that outreach and in what way they would partner with you. So whenever I take a team somewhere like Panama, I will contact multiple churches and oftentimes those churches will offer to let us come sleep in the church and to feed us. And because these are usually small churches of less than 50 people overseas, those are the average size of churches in, in like Panama is probably like 20 people. So 50 people is a decent sized church. The pastors themselves, because their churches are small and because they want to serve these missionaries, they will take it upon themselves to cook for the team while they're there. And so it's almost certain that Parham would have followed the same setup. He would have sent out letters down to Houston asking pastors to partner with him. And Lucy was probably, well, not probably, she was one of those pastors who volunteered to host and to serve him and his team. And so during that summer that Parham was there, she listened to him teach on Pentecost and Parham specifically focused on speaking in tongues, which of course is largely why the Pentecostal churches of today, they focus on speaking in tongues because that is that was like the crux, like the the... Pentecostals believe that speaking in tongues is the primary evidence. Well, it is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that's what Parham believed. He believed that that was the biblical evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And at this point in Topeka, Kansas, Parham, Charles Parham had a Bible school. And there was a reputation for virtually all of the students being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And whenever Parham was down in Houston... Luke, Lucy would have definitely seen the Holy Spirit moving during those meetings, and he, she would have been impacted for, by it, and she would have wanted it for herself. And so we, we don't really know how this went down. We don't know what happened, but she clearly impressed Parham and his wife, Sarah, and must have been particularly good with his children because at the end of the summer, Parham invited Lucy to move to Baxter, Baxter Springs, Kansas, into his home and to be what was called the governess of his children, which, which essentially meant that she was going to be the nanny. And Lucy agreed to go, almost certainly wanting to be part of the movement of the Holy Spirit there, wanting to receive the Holy Spirit herself. And so because she wanted to go and she was pastoring this church, she asked her good friend who wouldn't you know who it is, I bet you can guess, a young man who was about 10 years younger than her named William Seymour and asked him to take over pastoring her church, which he agreed to do. So Lucy moved with the Parhams back to Kansas and she lived with them for a time. And during her time when she was living in that home, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And we don't know really many details at all, but we do know that whatever she experienced, her it totally changed her life. Lucy, oh, by the way, Lucy is also the first recorded African-American woman in the United States, States to speak in tongues, which is just, it's, a, it's really amazing because Lucy, she had, there's so much mystery around her. Because like her, her birth date isn't even recorded. Slaves, much, much like uh, the Scottish people, 
obviously a very different situation. But Scottish people, they didn't really record dates. They didn't record birth dates. And so we don't we don't know a lot about Lucy's birth. We don't know. We know the year she was born, but we don't know her birthday. We don't know uh, really any of the details about her. And so, uh, which is unfortunate, almost all the details are about William Seymour, which, I mean, he is, he's an awesome guy, like I've said many times. But it's sad that Lucy, there, is, there aren't more details about her life. But anyway, she spent that time there. She spoke in tongues. And then she stayed about a year there with with the Parhams. And after a year, Lucy Farrow, she returned with the Parhams to Houston. And whenever they went to Houston, the intention was to pioneer a new Bible school. And so whenever she arrived in Houston, once again, after a year, she went and and, uh, met up with her old friend, William Seymour, who was still pastoring her church. And we can only imagine what she must have shared with William uh, about the miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit that she saw in her time with the Parhams. But whatever it was, she told Parham that he needed to go to this school that they were pioneering, that he needed to be a student in Parham's new school in Houston. And she convinced him to do so. Seymour agreed to do it. And at this point, William Seymour still wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. He still didn't speak in tongues. He didn't move in miracles. None of those things. He was technically just an average pastor of a small church in Houston. And so Seymour went to Parham School, and Lucy was a volunteer. She volunteered as the cook of the school. And this just this just resonates with me so much personally, because this is something that a lot of people don't understand about ministry, that it is largely about serving others. Most people think that it has to do with preaching in front of big crowds or doing all this flashy stuff, but it's really the people like Lucy who make sacrifices like she did that keep in, that keep any of those things going. I know for me, I've been on both sides of it. I've been I've been the guy speaking in churches and conferences and and doing all those things, but I I often even to this day I'm still the guy who's cleaning the church. Or whenever I was in Costa Rica, I had I, I moved to Costa Rica. I had been in Turkey as a missionary for two years and went from Turkey doing incredible ministry and facing persecution, all these things. And then I moved to Panama where I was working with among a a almost unreached tribe. And then I went to Costa Rica and for a year, the leaders there made me shepherd goats. I was the guy who milked goats and had to get up really early and go cut what was called uh, king grass to feed goats and all this. I mean, that's what I did for a year. And so I have, I can relate to people like Lucy who they're just willing to do it. They're willing to do whatever has to be done. It doesn't matter what it is. They just want to see the kingdom of God extended. And so I, I've been a cook many times for a lot of these teams I've told you about that I led. I also would cook for them, a cooking, sometimes cooking for teams of up to 100 people who've come to serve. I'd wake up at four or five in the morning and cook hundreds of pancakes. And we just, we just have to be willing to do anything for the kingdom. So while Lucy Farrow was serving, Seymour went to the Bible school. And as I said at the beginning of this podcast, it was it's horrible because even in Charles Parham school, think about this. Holy Spirit is moving powerfully through Charles Parham. And even though Parham is moving in the Holy Spirit, he still is an incredibly deeply flawed man and still has segregated classes. And so Seymour wasn't allowed to attend class in the Bible school, and he had to listen outside the door. And he wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit during the school. He only attended for six weeks because he was invited to Los Angeles. Remember, he was in Houston, he, Houston and he was invited to Los Angeles to pastor church there, and he took that offer. And he ended up going and being on this little street called Bonnie Bray Street, who we mentioned at the beginning, what we, that we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. And, uh, that's where he ended up. I, I, as I've said, I keep repeating this. I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot in this one, but I'm going to do, I I think, I guess I have to do a separate podcast on William Seymour, don't I? Because I, I'm just sort of going to cut off a bunch of his story here because he ended up moving to Los Angeles and Lucy Farrow, he stayed, she stayed behind and Seymour, he went and well, he went to Los Angeles, which is where the Azusa Street Revival happened, but we'll, we will move on to that here in a little bit. So Lucy, he stayed with, I keep saying he, sorry, Lucy, I'm getting excited. See, I got to slow down. Whenever I get excited, 
I start like just like barreling over my own words and making mistakes. So I'm going to slow this down a little bit. Now, Lucy stayed with the Parhams. All right. Seymour. Seymour had gone to Los Angeles. He was pastoring a church and Lucy stayed with the Parhams. And now whenever Seymour was there in Los Angeles, he still hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so he shared with this congregation about Lucy's experience and the power that he had seen and the, the testimonies that she had told. And so whether it was Seymour's idea or the congregation just getting really excited about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, whatever it was, they decided they wanted Lucy to come to Los Angeles and lay hands on them so they could receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Now, back then they didn't have cell phones or email or anything like that. And the Wright brothers who had been building airplanes, they had just completed well, not just, they had only completed their first successful 12-minute flight three years earlier in 1903. So all they had was land mail. And for the letter to be sent to Lucy and wait for her to reply and then send another letter and then respond to that one was just not something they were willing to wait for. So on faith, believing that the Holy Spirit wanted to pour out on them and baptize them, they took up an offering together, bought a train ticket for her, and just mailed it right along with the invitation. And Lucy, of course, accepted that invitation. She hopped on the train and arrived sometime in March 1906, and she was hosted by a man named Edward Lee, who was the same man that was hosting William Seymour as well. Now, Edward Lee was a very intelligent and wise man because he knew he didn't have the gifts of Seymour, which we know that gives, I, that's, I guess that's an overstatement for Seymour because he still wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit, but he knew he didn't have the gift of Lucy, the, that the Holy Spirit had given to Lucy. So he made sure that he got time to spend with both of them by hosting both of them. And this is a little tip for those of you who are hungry for something that someone else has in the kingdom that you don't have, whether it's a gift or a calling on their lives that you feel as well, find a way to spend time with them. And because these people are usually very, very busy, people who are working for the kingdom of God are often very, very busy people. And so it can be hard to get close to them. So learn from John Knox. If you haven't read, listened to that podcast, go listen to the John Knox podcast and see how he found a way to get close to his hero. But the best way to do it is find a way, be creative. And really the best way to do that is to either serve in their ministry or be like Edward Lee and serve them personally or support them in some way. And that will open up doors for you. So Edward knew this and he was hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Seymour still didn't have it. So as soon as Lucy Farrow gets off the train and steps into his living room, Edward Lee asks her to lay hands on him and pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a couple different accounts of how Edward was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this was a key moment for the Azusa Street Revival, so I'm going to tell you both of the accounts that I have read. One of the accounts says that immediately upon re meeting Lucy, Edward almost desperately asked her to lay hands on him for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but Lucy didn't believe in doing anything without feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit. Even when she was in a church service, when people lined up for prayer, she wouldn't pray for everybody. She would only pray for the people she felt the Holy Spirit telling her to pray for. So when Edward Lee asked her to pray for him, she said, I cannot unless the Lord says so. And apparently, apparently he didn't because she didn't pray for him. And they just went on preparing for dinner. And then in the middle of dinner, she suddenly stood up and said, the Lord tells me to lay hands on you for the Holy Ghost. Then she walked over, laid hands on him right there at the dinner table, and he was smacked right out of his chair by the Holy Ghost and started speaking in tongues. The second account, while less detailed, personally, I think is more reliable because it comes straight from the Azusa Street Mission Foundation, which is a ministry that is entirely dedicated to the, the Azusa Street Revival. It has a whole board of directors and people who have spent vast amounts of time studying every detail of this thing. And uh, you can actually find the link to the website. It'll be in the show notes if you want to check that out. But according to them, Edward Lee was actually sick. And Lucy, along with Seymour, were called to go pray for him on April April 9th, 1906. And when they laid hands on him for healing, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues right then. So regardless of whether, regardless of how it happened, Edward Lee got baptized in the Holy Spirit and Lucy lays, laid hands on him. And that was the spark that literally changed the world. 
right after that, whether it was their dinner after they had dinner or if Lee got healed and then he just got up or however it was that it went down, they left Lee's house to go to church. And as they walked into church, Edward Lee raised his hands while speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit fell on the church. I can only imagine what that must have looked like, but I I imagine that it was before he came in, it was probably like any regular church service, right? Like, like we have church today. It was probably people were talking about their favorite Mark Twain book, which Mark Twain was very old. And so they were probably in church out in the lobby and arguing about their, their or, or uh, talking about their favorite Mark Twain book or the incredible new book that had just came out that year, uh, 1906, remember, that was sweeping the nation called White Fang or uh, the or maybe they were talking about the the new movie that was going to be coming out that in November called The Automobile Thieves. It was the new it was 11 minutes long and they were probably all so excited because movies were brand new or maybe they were talking about the newest candy craze which was chiclets or maybe the rise of this new maybe that maybe even they were sipping on this new delicious headache medicine invented by a Dr. Pemberton called Coca-Cola. Now, I say that, of course, all of those things as a joke because revival does not happen in church services like that where everyone is just talking about all this pointless stuff. It happens when people are seeking Jesus on their faces with all their hearts in unity, which is why we don't have nationwide revival sweeping the United States right now when we need it most because most likely whenever Edward Lee and Parham and Lucy walked into the church. The people were probably on their face, seeking God, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, on their knees, crying out for more whenever these this trio walked in. And whenever Edward Lee started praying in tongues and walked in, the Holy Spirit fell on that place. People were flying out of their chairs, being filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a wild scene, so wild, in fact, that news immediately spread all over the neighborhood, and people started running to the church, because whenever the Holy Spirit starts moving for real, people are drawn to it, and they want it. The Holy Spirit moved on people all night, and by morning, the people couldn't even fit in the house, and... They had to participate from the front porch, the yard. The accounts say that you couldn't even get anywhere near the house because the Holy Spirit was moving so strongly. And these meetings went on like this for days. And finally, on April 12th, William Seymour, finally, after all of this time, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in these meetings, and he spoke in tongues. And as this is all going on, it becomes immediately apparent that they couldn't maintain the work that they were doing. They couldn't maintain the ministry in this tiny space that they had been meeting in. So they managed to find an old abandoned building in downtown Los Angeles, which now is, of course, the famous 312 Azusa Street Mission Building. They rented it out on Good Friday, April 13th, 1906, the day after William Seymour received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Lucy... She was just such a fascinating person because this this meeting, this this mission was this revival. It only got stronger. There were powerful miracles happening every single day. And according to multiple testimonies, the visible manifest presence, the Shekinah glory of God was resting on the Zoo Street mission. They said it was like a mist that was 24 hours a day. It was inside the building and supernatural manifestations were the norm. Miracles, powerful things were happening every single day. And Lucy stayed and supported this revival for the next four months. She was, of course, one of the leaders. That's why she's called the mother of Pentecost, because if she had not prayed for Edward Lee and he had not been filled with the Holy Spirit, if she had not come, none of this would have happened because William Seymour didn't have it. But it was through her ministry that these things happened. And, but, but Lucy, I don't know if it's because she had, was just so used to being in revival that she, I, it's, I don't mean to say this in like a negative way, but that she wasn't impressed by the Azusa Street Revival or she just felt like the Holy Spirit was moving her on, which is, of course, the more likely one. But uh, regardless of that, Lucy stayed and supported the revival for the next four months as one of the leaders and incredible. She was she was known, specifically, she was known for laying hands on people and for, ha- for them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
But during those four months, the Holy Spirit was putting on her heart, or maybe before, we don't know for sure, but we know that it started to become an urgent thing for her over the next four months that she was called to go to Africa. Her family had been taken as slaves from Liberia, which is a small nation on the northwestern coast of Africa, and God had put it on her heart to go there and preach the gospel in the land of her family. So after those four months in the Azusa Street Revival, she went to Virginia where she helped birth yet another outbreak of the Holy Spirit. She was in Virginia for several weeks leading meetings, and reportedly 150 people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you you have to remember that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was new, and even people like William Seymour found it hard to understand and receive. So a number like 150 is massive in those days. She knew that she was called back to Africa And she didn't want to get stuck pastoring these new converts in Virginia. So she contacted once again her good friend, William Seymour, and asked him to send a pastor to replace her, which he did. And whenever her replacement arrived, Lucy went to New York and hopped on a boat and sailed to Liberia as a missionary. She ended up on a small village or in a small village called Johnsonville, which is near the capital of Monrovia. I mean, this is just amazing to me. I just have to throw this in there that... She, man, what a brave, what an awesome woman. She, she, she has, she's in the middle of this incredible revival, but I'll tell you what, if you ever study, if you really study revivals or you stick with me here in these podcasts, you are going to find that there is definitely a, a pattern in revivals. Revivals are full of patterns, which is one of the reasons I'm excited about these podcasts, especially these bio episodes is because we see patterns And one of the patterns of revival is people get transformed locally and then people get sent out into the world. And Lucy, even though she was one of the leaders and oftentimes leaders don't go, they stay and they send. But Lucy, she went. And so she gets on this boat, she goes to Liberia, and there are not a lot of details that I was able to find about her ministry in Liberia but it was reported that she was supernaturally given the language of the crew people, which is the tribal people that she was ministering to, and that there were a lot of miracles and that the Holy Spirit was moving in power, which I think those things are a given considering her ministry. And since, since fruit is a big indicator of impact, I just want you to know that the crew people of Liberia currently, right now today, have a population of nearly 300,000 people. They are... 80, 81% Christian. And in Northern Africa, which is one of the most unreached places on earth and is almost entirely Muslim, and there is so much violence and so much persecution against Christians in Northern Africa, it is extremely impressive and a testimony, a testament to the ministry of Lucy and other missionaries who've gone before her, the impact that she must have had on the crew people, because it's that is not a common... It is not common in North Africa to have a tribe that's primarily Christian. We don't know exactly how long Lucy was in Liberia. We know that eventually she sailed back to the United States and she made her way back to Los Angeles, back to the Azusa Street Mission. And she was there until 1911 when she contracted tuberculosis. And while she was sick, she stayed in what they would call a faith cottage, which I'm not sure... Exactly. I may have to look in. I feel like possibly it might have been similar to a healing room that the healing rooms that John G. Lake set up as well. Or actually, I think I think that the Faith Cottage could also very well have been just where the ministers, like the parsonage, the, that ministers would have stayed in. So I don't I don't want to throw out things and just say, oh, this is what it was. Whenever I'm not really sure, but either way. She was sick with tuberculosis, and she stayed in the Faith Cottage, which was a small house behind the Azusa Street Mission building. And even while she was sick, people were coming and visiting her. Many people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Many people were healed. And she continued to minister there until she died of this sickness. And just like her birth, the exact date of her death is unknown. And that's that, which is sad to me that there she was she birthed so many powerful moves of the holy spirit that uh, there's so little known about her i mean it seems like there's a lot of detail here which is true 
But the fact that they don't know when she was born, they don't know when she was when she died. They don't even know. They, I mean, they know she had tuberculosis, and almost certainly that's how she died. But they don't even know the exact circumstances of her death. Who was with her? Where? If she was in her house, or they don't know any of those things. And that just it's such a sad it's such a sad thing for me, because I think someone like her should be honored, just like William Seymour was. She should be she should be honored for what she did. And so that, that's how, Lu, that's the end of Lucy's life. That's, that is the end of her ministry. It was short. It was a short ministry, but it was a very powerful. And now naturally the question many people are going to ask is why a person like Lucy who moved so much in the power of the Holy Spirit and God used to heal so many people, why did she die of sickness? Now, while we don't have time to tackle all of this theology on this right now, all I, all I will say is this, because we're getting to the end here, my personal belief is that it is never God's will for anyone to die sick. I don't believe in the whole God is punishing me or God is trying to teach me something. I don't believe that. I, I believe that uh, the, the gospel is life. The gospel brings light. It doesn't bring sickness. It doesn't bring death. And that's my, my belief on it. And I won't get into all the theology, but my personal belief is that it is never God's will for anyone to be sick, but I can tell you from experience myself personally in my own body and my own ministry that it is much, much easier to believe for another person to be healed than to believe for oneself to be healed. The reason that I, I, I say that is because we have to understand that people are people. people. So many men and women of God have died of sicknesses. And this is always a point of contention because especially healing evangelists, they seem to get sick and die. And people use that as like an accusation, like, oh, well, if it was true, then why weren't they healed? Well, they're still human. Lucy Farrow was still a human. John G. Lake, Catherine Coleman, these people were all humans. And it's easy to have faith. I, it's easy to have faith for somebody that you don't know because you don't know them. You don't know their flaws. It's so much harder to have faith for ourselves to be healed because we know all of our flaws. We know all of our issues and we know our mistakes. We know that we're not worthy. And we preach forgiveness. We preach grace. But come on, anyone who's honest would can tell you honestly it's a lot easier to forgive other people than to forgive ourselves. Even though we know it, even though we believe it as much as we can and we say it, it's you constantly have that voice, the enemy's voice or your own voice saying, oh yeah, but you did this, you did that, blah, blah, blah. This is your past. And we can quote all of the memes and all of the little quips that people like to say, you know, the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of your future, you remind him of his future and all that stuff that people, the little cutesy quotes that people do and don't take seriously. The, um, there, it's true though, is the devil will remind you of your past and he does it because it's effective. He does it because it is very hard to get past our own mistakes. And so even though we can pray for people to be healed and people are healed, it can be extremely difficult to have faith for ourselves, which is why we need each other, which is why we need to, to have other people pray for us. And so if I have a knee that has been destroyed for years. I was playing soccer with some kids in Panama and I ended up having a severe injury, tore all the ligaments in my knee. And I went to the doctor for it. He said I needed surgery. And it, it's still, I didn't have surgery for it. I'm still believing for healing for it. And if I twist it the wrong way at all, some days I'll barely, I'll just like turn around and all of a sudden my whole knee twists. And sometimes I'll spend days limping. Sometimes I can't even walk. I've been believing for it to be healed for years and it hasn't been. But I've prayed for people who are vomiting blood on their deathbed. The doctor saying they were going to die of cancer that day and prayed for them and they were instantly healed. And if you heard, if you heard my, my testimony, my story with Jonna, the, the interview episode, I want to say episode three, the interview with Jonna. If you haven't listened to that yet, uh, we both share all kinds of testimonies, all kinds of stories of God, God's healing and, and just miraculous ways. But we have our own issues. And that's because I think it all just boils down to as your faith is, so be it unto you. And we're all human 
and we all have faith in some areas and other areas we lack faith in just because of usually because of lack of experience. So thank you for listening. Please share this with your friends. Help me get the word out about this podcast. And if there are any shirts left and you're interested, let me know. You can do it through the podcast uh, Facebook page. Uh, I, I do add some little behind the scenes, scenes things. I put some show notes on there. I put some pictures and stuff for you to follow and just for you to keep in track because I like you guys and I want to hear from you. So if you guys can, you know, sign up there, like it and, and uh, share this podcast. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. Like you guys, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, I mean, you, you share, you share pictures of like the thing your, your cat threw up or the thing your baby pooped out. Like, it, it really it wouldn't hurt you just to post a little a little shout out to to the the revival carriers Facebook or the revival carriers podcast. Come on, if you can post that, you can you can post this and be like, hey, learn about Lucy Farrow. She was an amazing woman of God, and we need to know her story. So have a great day, guys. Thank you. I will see you again next Thursday for another wonderful and a wonderful episode.